Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining for us for week five of our digital event. We are talking about the supplier data crisis, and it is my pleasure to announce Tim Herod, who is taking a different twist on, on this week's uh, webinar series. Well, he'll actually teach you how to act on the information that you've learned in weeks one through four. So Tim has led multiple digital transformations, and through the presentation today, you'll learn not only about how to think about it from a digital perspective, how to think about it from a personnel perspective, and how to think about it from a data perspective, but actually how to act on some of these principles. Tim, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Matt, and to, to Stephanie uh, for the opportunity to engage in the essential topics that this webinar series is, is discussing. And I think as we all sit at home, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, pound through all of the things that we, we would do in different ways in a new way, um, the topics covered in this series have been very valuable and, and hopefully we can, we can add some more value today. Uh, for folks who have heard me speak uh, before at Procurement Leaders or SCM World, ProcureCon, CPA Canada stuff, I am passionate and a bit direct on things, um, but they are just my views. So uh, if there are some gold nuggets, uh, the price of gold's up again today, but just, you know, take, take, uh, take the pieces that, that make sense and ignore the rest. But I think that's how, uh, how I look at, at transformation in general. So we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, if you want to know more about me, uh, you can go to LinkedIn and, and, and find out. I'll sprinkle in a little bit of experience uh, and background throughout. Um, and I'll declare conflicts as I go also. But, uh, but it's better, I think, uh, ha having, having us just get right into it. So in terms of the agenda, we're going to cover sort of five, five areas. Um, and you can kind of see what those areas are. Data is going to be the thread uh, strung through all of these sections and supplier data specifically, um, given Tealbook is, is hosting this, uh, this thought leadership series and, and engaging us all in this. So definitely spending some time there. Um, I think, you know, when we think about the posture of proc the procurement function, the transformation uh, foundations and capabilities, uh, digital data, advanced analytics, data science, uh, and the application of it. I think that's the different lens from the other speakers that I will take. Uh, and then we'll close out what I think uh, spending a fair amount of time and a reasonable amount of time in the time we have talking about the future because none of this matters if, if our procurement functions are not adding value in the world we're in or the world that we're headed into. Um, and and we'll get right into it. I think the first thing uh, that I think is, is really important, and, and this isn't as much about data as it, as it is about um, why does procurement exist? Why do we have a procurement function? And you've heard uh, through this, through the, the previous weeks, I'm sure if you listen and read, and there's lots, lots and an increasing amount of thought leadership about procurement and supply chain and value on uh, on LinkedIn and, and other, you know, other really smart people uh, talking about it. Uh, lots of commentary about why procurement uh, can't get a seat at the table, uh, why senior leaders don't value the function, how difficult it is to get investment, um, you know, that it's hard to, you know, for them to see the value for there for the, for them to invest in it, uh, to understand, to listen to reason, uh, for them to follow processes, use the tools they do whatever they want with suppliers. They don't believe in savings um, in value when you when you try to sell it. Um, and I think it, the very first thing to talk about is that is that business leaders' priorities, motivations, incentives, decision frameworks, internal political maneuverings, and behaviors in general are substantially different or can be substantially different than, than the procurement leaders' um, um, priorities as well as the procurement function. And that's just a reality. Uh, the, the challenges and constraints when we think about uh, when we think about the world that we live in uh, is is you know it it just is going to be something that has to be navigated and so the very first thing to to talk about is is to get real there are there are constraints we're going to talk about those um, the business has different expectations with respect to what procurement does or doesn't do if they feel like uh, somebody is 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 not adding value to them is not uh, looking out for their business is not managing the risks and are going to make decisions counter to their objectives they're going to have an issue um, if they don't make it easy for them they won't follow 
and and obviously there has to be some value delivered. So we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about that value a lot and the question of what is value and and what is it to who. Um, again, another reality check, and that's the, sort of the get real. You can't just say we're important. We have to we have to show that we're important. We have to align to the business priorities, align to what the business says value is, and what the business leaders say value is. And if we don't do that, we will never get ahead. So the first thing I, I'll mention, you know, we need to look at how we're adding value strategically, and if we're adding value strategically, uh, it, the function exists or should exist. Um, and any procurement leader of a function worth his or her salt has to has to try to understand how to add that value to the business. So looking in and coming in and, and talking about and uh, creating an organization that can do that. The first, if you think about cost, capital cost, cost of goods sold, OPEX, CAPEX, goods services, whatever it happens to be, the ticket to play is 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 life cycle uh, total cost of ownership reduction. Uh, that is simply what the business perceives that that if you're doing anything, if we can believe it, that's what you're doing. It's the least strategic of of the opportunities for a procurement function, but you have to do it the best. There are strategic aspects of it, not to say it's not. But at the end of the day, the more valuable you are to the business, the more that they're going to buy into what you want to do, the more they're going to get out of the function, and the more it's going to be a positive self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. So you obviously have to manage cost and, and help facilitate value that way. Um, up the up the line in terms of strategic value is if if the function can positively impact price or revenue growth through innovation. How does how does how can the procurement function facilitate innovation, uh, quality, uh, safety of of suppliers and products on time and in full uh, when competitors can't do it in certain market conditions? So certain uh, things, and this is just this is just these are just examples, but more strategic things that the business uh, can expect from the function, and then even more strategic, and and maybe there's even more ideas than this, but what can procurement do? to enhance the brand of the company, the brand of the business? How does it enhance reputation? How do you conduct business? Uh, how do you take care of suppliers through, through tough cycles? Uh, how do you unlock value for the customer and, and reduce friction for the customer? How do you deal with corporate social responsibility, uh, supply chain diversity, local procurement? Um, when you have uh, in the organization's driving growth, how do you come to the table and say, let us help deliver synergies? We're really good at that. Uh, so I think that if 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 the function does not align to the business in that way, uh, we're gonna we're gonna lose out of the gate. Uh, the other thing, though, is to start, you know, and I think there's a lot of conversation um, in previous weeks and in general. And I've noticed this, and I've mentioned this at other, you know, when I've spoken at procure at procurement leaders, for example, where I just say. I listen to all the speakers and everybody's aligned. Everybody al is aligned on the problems. Everybody's aligned with, this would be great, uh, but the how is, isn't discussed a lot. And that's more of what, what I'll talk about today. And it starts with, uh, in terms of establishing business alignment and starting at the start, um, in terms of what is the current state and taking a data-driven approach to, to diagnosing uh, what's going on at the company, what the, is going on in the business, understanding and gaining knowledge in the business so that when you go and have a conversation with business leaders, you're educated. Um, you can understand all of the aspects end to end of how money is made, uh, how risk is managed, how decisions are made, uh, what the expectations and culture is, um, how, the, how the interrelationships amongst leaders works, who really has the power and who doesn't. And then you get into the actual, like to do a good job of a, of a procurement transformation and to run a function in the long term, you know what? You know, spend data, supplier uh, data, which we'll talk about, product uh, item master data. If you're generating millions of transactions per day or week, how are we capturing customer and and, and product data? Uh, material master data, service master data. What is what is our starting point in terms of uh, where where are we as an organization? And as you know, it's typically data has been. Um, markedly underinvested in and and so the starting point is unclear and that poor foundation then causes difficulty all the way along through the transformation with your leaders with the business uh, is any is you know with suppliers um, the stakeholders through the supply chain uh, you have to also diagnose the capability and capacity of interdependencies to help you transform you don't transform in a silo so you need to gather data about how is hr position to support how is it how is legal uh, how is the rest of the finance function which anything you do wrong up front washes its way down into accounts payable uh, and then finally um, 
you need to gather data about the digital philosophy and the digital maturity of the organization. This alignment, this data, and, and you shouldn't take a job, by the way, if if this last piece, uh, if the digital philosophy, philosophy of maturity is not where uh, you think it should be, uh, that's grounds to not take a job, I think, these days. So I think the, the the reality of gathering this data, understanding the current state, you then have a chance to say to the business, when you go and have a, a conversation with them, okay, here's, I've heard you, uh, and and we want to you know here's just examples how do we how do we set goals how do we align on them and how does it resonate with the business so that when you come have repeated conversations you're talking about these things that matter service uh, savings and EBITDA and, and and cost reduction partnership with business partnership with suppliers uh, best practices and digital and governance uh, in, in a standardized way and then most importantly um, as you look ahead in the future is talent. How do we, how are we uh, perceived as a talent hub internally? How do we attract the best and the brightest in the company to want to come and work in procurement, uh, build and leverage those connections, have a stop in their career and then go be a great leader somewhere else in the organization. And then how do we attract that internally, uh, excuse me, from the outside world. So if you, understand the business, you can align procurement goals. These are some of them. You'll have your own that makes sense, but that's how you gain uh, that alignment is, is, is you align on goals. And then very importantly, and, and when you look at taking the goals, taking the understanding of the business, taking that data and, and saying, okay, if I organize it, what's really happening in the company? I can then pull a number of levers and focus investment in a number of areas. It's impossible to do it all at the same time. They're all starting in a different spot. They're all going to end in a different spot over time. But you you need to pull all of these levers at some point to be able to deliver for what the business uh, for what the business is expecting. So I, you can see some of the topics uh, discussed. I'll I'll get Sorry. into Siri. I said something that Siri. Uh, wanted to talk about um, but anyways we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about some of these but if you're not moving on all of these things your procurement transformation will not reach full potential um, so so that's an important uh, aspect I think um, the last thing on business alignment um, before we get into into more detail is is leadership um, again this idea that procurement is not you know is not um, does not have the profile that the leaders and the function would want in an organization a lot of it comes down to leadership um, at all levels in the company in the procurement function um, and one of the thing one of the greatest leaders that I've ever worked for um, ta he taught us as a team this and repeated this and I have continued to do this but if we want to have a posture in the organization that that reflects value and importance and and a mindset that's strategic. Uh, we have to model that. Um, and so, in terms of uh, a model, an exemplary exemplary leadership model, um, the Mickey or Micey, depending how you want to pronounce it, we have to really be focused on setting an environment for excellence and expectations around culture, teamwork and team play, agility, compassion, gratitude, curiosity, pragmatism. Uh, and it's modeling the way we have to we have to model the way for our team members for our function if our function is it, we want it to be the shining star in the organization and we're asking hr it finance and legal to come along with us we need to model the way we have to tell a great story inspire a shared vision of the value that we're, we're out to deliver we have to challenge the process and continually beat up the way it's been done before we have to we have to enable and, uh, and empower others to act on the team and then in the business, we have to trust the business to be able to take the tools we give them and do it if we make it easy for them. And then of course, we have to encourage the heart and we have to be really inspiring as we go through it. If we do not adopt and adapt uh, or cause to adapt the right posture in the organization, procurement will not and the function will not achieve full potential. So I think it's an important it's a, it's an important point as we get into it. It's one that's worth a couple minutes of talking about it. From the foundations and capabilities, uh, piece. I'll move. Some of these slides are are, are for example. I'll, I'll go through them pretty quickly. A couple I'll spend more time on. Um, but there are. We get into foundation and capabilities. The first thing I'll mention is is savings. Um, when we get into when we get into the topic of uh, what what does the business believe? What does the business value? At the end of the day, the ticket to play is savings. People don't like to talk about it. It's like you know we're about innovation and we're about. Um, we're about a you know corporate social responsibility, and we're about a lot of things. At the end of the day, the business leaders um, have P and Ls to manage. They have cost objectives. They have they have targets for their owners, targets for the street, 
And procurement has to have a mindset that we're at cause, we're delivering results, uh, and we're creating, and, and the leaders know that there's tension in that. Causing change, uh, pulling people along, encouraging people to come along uh, creates tension. And how do we keep that tension healthy as we go along? But it's a virtuous cycle. Another thing we'll talk about in the digital component of this is where's my investment? I want I want money. If I had, if only I had this money to be able to invest in the function and invest in the enterprise as it relates to my function, I could deliver you all this value. And the reality is every other function, every other business unit is saying the same thing. And today, as we look at this, what we expect is a rapid acceleration in digital investment out of this COVID um, circumstance, uh, we're going to be in a bigger battle for for funds and for for resources. Uh, so we have to we have to engage authentically. We have to actually deliver savings. We have to use that to establish credibility. Um, to 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 get investment and reinvest wisely, and then sell and storytell and do that over and over and over again. And it starts with data, spend analytics, creating that roadmap, agile work plans. Um, we look at at spend and savings, what matters to whom, who are the champions for this. It might not be the biggest opportunity, but if we start with a champion, we can get there faster. Uh, the idea here is you have to start generating ROI quickly. We can't wait. You know, thanks for the investment. We're building a a skyscraper will eventually populate the skyscraper and then we'll go off. That's not how it works and that's not how it can work in a procurement transformation. You start small, we move fast, we get quick wins in. Um, we'll talk about uh, Tealbook, um, you know, how Tealbook can help in that and how we're using it at, at the, the, the client I'm currently leading the transformation on uh, and how our team is doing it. Um, identifying and attacking sole sourcing, looking at larger projects that have shorter durations but have a time frame and an end date and, a, and an engaged business user that wants the value, uh, looking at higher value, lower complexity categories, and to, and to build category capability, uh, better category capability, and then doing that over and over again, powering up and growing, and, and again, making this a positive self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's the reality of, you know, in my view of, if it starts the foundations and the capabilities, everything starts with the savings, okay? You have to earn your way there. Uh, then it gets into a couple of concepts that I think are really important today and is going to are going to be really uh, important going forward. The, the first one is um, is agile. I worked with one of the m most brilliant guys uh, that I've that I've had the pleasure of working with in, the, in an IT leader, uh, who I borrowed this from. And it's like, look, everything we do, um, we can't get into this world anymore of building big things and delivering three years from now, and then getting there three years from now and finding out that we missed 50% because we didn't engage anybody. Okay, we got to think big, act now, start small, scale fast. Okay, agile, agile mindsets. Uh, you know, and 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 not just you know sort of that concept, but actually adopting agile principles in terms of teamwork and transparency, um, satisfying and real uh, a real customer focus, welcoming change, delivering frequently, breaking things down into pieces, working together and delivering continual results, measuring progress, uh, selling and storytelling, and being sustainable in how we do it, keeping it simple, um, and and delivering in that way. Okay, that's a really important foundation for transformation looking ahead. Uh, really quick, quickly, if you take the business alignment and you take what the data told you about what value is and how you're going to get it, you take that value roadmap, how do you design a procurement function to be able to deliver on that? And so this is an example. This is what we're working on right now. Uh, my previous uh, my previous leadership role at at Nutrien and and in Potash Corp. Before that, we had some version of this, uh, where this there are strategic value. Um, Walt, I heard say 80% of the value last week is in in number one here, uh, category management, strategic sourcing. That theoretically is true. The reality is, if the business doesn't use the contracts that come out of number one here, it's all a theory, and this is a major problem with procurement credibility that I've seen and lived. As we get out, and, and consultants are really bad for that. I I am I am part of what I do right now with, with as an external advisor to Bain and Company. That's not my primary gig uh, right now, but you know I've given Bain a lot of feedback in the past as we've used them and other advisors. Um, you can't get to the end of of an initiative uh, and a sourcing event and a contract and and say what a win. You have to actually execute on that. So you, if you haven't engaged with the business end to end, and you deliver a, a contract to the business that's it, and you say, now, okay, go use it, and you try to do that across you know dozens of operating sites 
or, or hundreds of operating sites and the business wasn't involved, they're not going to use it. If you don't make it easy, they're not going to use it. If you don't give them tools and they can operate in a, in a really effective way, it, there is no value. There's no value to number one if you don't do number two and number three well. So you have to set up your organization in a way that makes sense, uh, that aligns to the business and ultimately can actually execute on the value. I heard a number of questions in previous weeks about talent. I think it's important. It's an important consideration uh, to be realistic about the talent foundation in the organization. Again, you can take a data-driven approach to talent, uh, both externally in terms of what's in the market and internally in what capabilities you have. But you have to actually, when you look at future skills and abilities in a world where soft skills are now the core skills and strategic capability matters a great deal, when you look through your your business and in, in the current my current um, the procurement transformation I'm leading, we have a, a new center led function, but we have a bunch of procurement people people doing procurement, hundreds of them that are touching the procurement process in parts of the, the business units in in, in various in various parts uh, appropriately. But when you go to look at what's needed in the future, you can't assume everybody has it and they're going to pick it up very well. But the reality of the marketplace is these future skills, um, those core, you know, those new core skills uh, don't exist in the marketplace in very many places. And your ability to go out and buy them are, is very, very limited. So the reality is you have to build it and you have to borrow it internally. So you're looking for people and you're trying to attract people into the function and you're trying to you're trying to reshape uh, what you have, and that it takes a lot of time and skill and effort to plan and execute that. But it is a core foundation, and happy to talk about that. The last foundation I'll talk about today is change. And I think when we look at, in our example right now, we have about a dozen different targeted digital things that we're doing uh, to enable new policy, process, governance, uh, ways of doing uh, business and ways of working. And the reality is when you think about um, that plus all of the future opportunity, which I'll share with you, um, you have to really, t like, you just can't throw them, um, you know, sort of a, an instruction manual and say good luck um, and expect them to actually adopt. And if they don't adopt, you don't get the savings, you don't get the value. So there's a lot at stake in terms of planning and executing really good change. And I think the way that I would recommend doing it and that we've had success recently um, is taking actually this design thinking approach. Um, when you when you think about upfront, if you stack those all up and said, okay, who are the users? What are their personas? How many are there? What do we? What can we actually plan for in terms of resistance? What will cause them to embrace? How can we craft and design that upfront to make them all go better? Uh, and what tools and assets can we put in their hands or give them access to that will help that adoption be as seamless as possible? So you take a, a collaborative approach with those end users and personas. Um, they have the best view of the of the problems and the potential solutions. They the jobs to be done. They live them. They don't live them in the new way that you want them to live, but they know what they're trying to do um, and, and they need to be engaged end to end. So designing with people and not for people early as a foundation in procurement transformation, again, starts with data around those personas, around those users, around the current state and, and doing a lot of work uh, on that. Okay. The digital, I'm going to, this is going to be fairly quick. There's been lots of talk about digital. I don't disagree, my, my favorite, I'm on the ISM Thought Leadership Council with Stephanie, as well as with Eloise, who you heard a couple of weeks ago, who is brilliant. And we have, a, we, we have great um, debates on things, but also great alignment on other things. I think when it comes to digital transformation approach, the reality is that there is an old way. And back in 2013, when I moved I'm a, an accountant that did investor relations in through multiple crises for five years and then went and ran a treasury transformation after the financial crisis and then had, after an industry crisis and costs started to matter, had the opportunity to lead a procurement transformation. And when that was back in 2013, uh, the way that it was done for to go from a decentralized that had been decentralized for 50 years across almost 20 mines, mills, and chemical plants, people that are not prone to change, uh, very rigid process, complex. It took a couple of years to plan. Uh, people standing on the tables, on their chairs, yelling at each other about uh, their practices getting into the new way. And after you know months and years of that, you know, uh, customizing an Oracle enterprise, uh, excuse me, uh, enterprise asset management and I procurement system, uh, rolling it out in a kind of a poor way, uh, really drive by. It's hard to get quickly through that many sites and then getting to the sites and finding out that, oh yeah, we told you that you own your data 
and why haven't you cleansed your data? Uh, and and it's like, well, we can't wait for them. We have to continue implementing. And at the end of the day, you wind up with hundreds of temporary people that are now permanent because you didn't do it right. Uh, then through, uh, we, we planned and executed one of the, we had a, a big culture difference when we went, uh, my, I was leader of a procurement function through a merger of equals and um, almost the first year after. And while the, um, uh, you know, while while the culture was different, we absolutely aligned on the need to do a better job from a from a digital perspective, and we tried. Uh, we went in an extensive process. We went with you know a platform, one of the e procurement solutions, and, and now that has soured my view of platforms forever because we tried to do too much too fast, um, and those platforms do one or two things well, but we got a little bit better at it. The new way now though is like let's look at the users, let's look at the job to be done. Uh, we can be flexible in the way we think about it. We can target. We can leverage the cloud more. We can we can leverage foundations more. If we're focused on our users and their experience first, and we create quality data, we're not just taking old data that's being you know that dirty data is being generated all day every day while we're trying to clean a portion of that doesn't really work. So there's a, there's new ways to go at this, and I'll talk about that in a second. It started at, at, uh, at FCL where I'm um, leading the procurement transformation with a great team. Uh, that team plus the business unit owners plus those in interdependencies got together a couple of times and workshopped this. And at the end of the day, we, we set a digital ambition and we voted on, on, we had a dozen or more priorities that are ambitions. And just to give you a sense of, you know, that group said number one, so 50% of the voters said master data, uh, master data management is the number one uh, ambition that we have is getting that aligned. We had spend insights, digital self-service, and then automation. So, you know, going through something like that, uh, setting a roadmap. So what is the, you know, this is an example, borrowed it from, from Bain, who's advising us uh, right now um, and, and helped us with this workshop. But how do you take the organization's digital ambitions? How do you look at, you know, where you want to get to? How do you look at today? And how do you actually break this into pieces and move it along? And we did that by looking at the jobs to be done, we looked at personas. We had seven different personas, and we went, we walked end to end through four different procurement journeys, and we said, "Here's what we're trying to do uh, for, you know, for our end users and for the business end to end." And at the end of the day, we came up with use cases, and we said, "Okay, when through these procurement journeys, we have a number of use cases uh, sourced. The, the, there are more journeys than this, but we try to consolidate it in something that was manageable in a workshop." Uh, you guys get these slides and moving quickly through this. Um, and then we, we we looked and said, okay, what are we going to do first, second, third? Because we don't have unlimited budget. We have to create and leverage wins. There's a way to go about um, deciding in terms of low difficulty, high impact, or high value. Okay, let, what are those things? And let's aim there first. So the, we looked at value and attractiveness, a cost savings potential. So what's the ROI if we get it done quickly? Um, what are the categories and how... how uh, uh, how, how much you know? How much value is sitting in, embedded in those? Uh, what is the sustainability of those savings? If we you know, is it a quick win? Is it a capital thing that we get a quick hit, but it, it's not repeatable, um, or is it something that is that is there is actually run rate value? And then ease of implementation really important. How quickly? How long can you do it if you use an agile method? The point of the agile approach isn't that we're doing a hundred things an inch at a time. It is that we're getting you know one, two, five things done. And we'll do that again and again and again. And then we can use that story and we can share that value with people and build momentum and, and get that stuff done and actually make people's lives better who have to use these tools. So that's the, you know, that's kind of how we how we went about it. Um, I'm going to I'm giving kudos here to Eloise um, because not, you know, again, we disagree on some things. And I don't think this big six, if you listen to her, her I don't think they're just going to give up the space. But there is a reality that. Uh, in today's world with AI machine learning getting better and better um, the, and automation getting better and better and the foundations getting better and better that you can increasingly plug and play things that actually work better. So if you have to manage investment, you can't go in one shot and say, I have $10 million. Uh, the subscription is small, but the SI cost is really large uh, that I that I actually can go and do that. I want to enable choice. I want to I want to have better flexibility, better optionality for the future. I'm going to target those things, and the and the actual supply market, the vendor market, for great solutions for certain use cases is getting better and better, and connecting them together is getting easier and easier. And I'll give you sort of a, an in depth on one one part of that, which again we're here because Tealbook put this on. 
uh, as a as a as a conflict. I've declared Bain as a conflict. Officio we're using as a part of that uh, right now. Currently, I've used I've been a part of and led Bain transformations for, uh, as as they work you know as as now um, since 2013 in a number of different capacities through merger and stuff. Uh, but we're also a customer of Tealbook, and it was one of the first investments made at FCL because. When looking at the data, when looking at what could be quick wins, when looking at what the symptoms were that we saw, um, we had a we, we you know we we had a number of really obvious use cases that could unlock value quickly. Uh, the the current client has, and, and you know the, the transformation leading they have at least in terms of strategic and enabling business units at least twelve, and those business units are very different. We'll talk about that in a sec. And they have, but they use many of the same suppliers, many of the same categories, many of the same industries, many of the same products, materials, and services, um, and they do it all on their own. So in a, that's very common in a decentralized structure, but we needed to create visibility of that. Uh, su suppliers, you know, they don't know who to talk to in the organization. They're talking to, you know, one, two, five different people in the organization. Again, it's a, it's a matter of that of the decentralized. So we needed to centralize and share information to create visibility and to allow people to collaborate about those suppliers across the team and across the businesses. Um, getting visibility into that supplier base, the internal supplier base, um, and, and enriching that so we could share more valuable stuff. Uh, leveraging that then, you know, actually using the power of the machine learning to say, okay, in this geography, in this industry, uh, for this stuff, and with these capabilities, here are five more suppliers, and now we have a way to go after the, just the rampant sole sourcing that happens in a decentralized world where there isn't a procurement function to help, uh, a, a, you know, a center-led procurement function to help. That's very common. Not, it works. The work gets done. The business operates with sole sourcing, but there's value left on the table. But we have to have a way to, to present alternative suppliers, and this was this was. Uh, useful for that. So finding those suitable suppliers, looking at the, the universe, the reality is that everything we do in terms of strategic procurement involves a supplier in some way or should. Everything we do connects. Um, the more data, supplier data we have, the more value we can create. Uh, this is Kyle, who is the, um, he worked, I put him through a lot of pain and suffering at Potash Corp and Nutrien and now is the, the procurement leader at, at FCL. Uh, great line, like the vendor master is not the, the supplier universe and a lot of people focus on the vendor master and getting insights to that. The reality is the vendor master contains who you do business with, who you pay, who you've, who you've paid in the past, and it's not the world of suppliers that can help you. So how do we get visibility into that? Uh, looking inside out, so enriching from the inside, um, the business knows who they work with or who they've considered, and then outside in, the machines and the, and the AI can, can find and match and use that. So faster, better, cheaper um, in terms of in terms of trying to do this yourself versus leveraging a tool like Tealbook. Um, the reality is through the business, one of the things we're working with is how do you um, how do you leverage that in a really effective way uh, in terms of the supplier interaction. So one of the things now that we have it and now that we've been using it, and we'll talk about it a little bit in one second about COVID and how we're using it for COVID. But the reality is when you look across platforms, and we used uh, we chose SAP Ariba. SAP Ariba is in, the, in my previous uh, role, very good platform. Uh, are, there's, there's, there are core things that it does really well, but there are the things that, that, it, that it doesn't do very well at all. And when you look back at Eloise's slide to say, you know, where are the really the strengths and what are the other things you just have to live with? If you have more optionality to choose the right things for the right applications, the reality is they all have a touch point in, into a supplier data point in some way. We've done some homework, Amanda on our team is, and, and her team is, has been working with end users in the business to say, how do you interact with suppliers? What data do you want and need? And how will you use it? Uh, and it may or may not be in that vendor master. So our idea here is everything that, you know, that golden record, that supplier golden record, where uh, it doesn't all have to live in that central place, but the central place has to have enough and it has to point to the other places. So a user uh, can go to one place and find everything they need to know. And the supplier, when they come into the company, has one experience, and and that's from an onboarding perspective, that's the that's sort of the dream scenario. So registration gets you the universe, can get you the universe. Actual deciding to source, not there's one winner in a sourcing event, or maybe a small number of winners in a sourcing event, a bunch of people that don't, or a bunch of businesses that don't, um, and then 
you know, and then ultimately at the end of the day, uh, what is the what is the transaction and what's what are you doing managing the supplier that you already have? So you have to make sure that through this life cycle that you have the one source of truth. That's our vision. We're trying to do it and we're hopeful that we can. So that's a little bit about, I think, the supplier data conversation. We can every one of these topics we can talk for days about. Uh, my last piece that I want to talk about is is the future. I'll try to get through this. I know I'm um, just getting close to time here. Okay, COVID is a, if you think about all the things we talked about, if you think about uh, business alignment, if you think about leadership and posture, um, if you think about uh, the foundations that you have and you have at your disposal to leverage in whatever shape they're in, if you think about digital and data, uh, really being key to driving the future or driving to the future and what that roadmap is. And you take that all and you say, okay, what is, what is the, the bit, like the world's always changing, but this is something we're dealing with now that nobody's ever seen. Nobody has ever seen and nobody knows what's going to happen. So applying all of this in a procurement lens and a procurement leadership lens, I think is an important conversation to have. So first of all, never waste a cri crisis. And I think that's one that's overused probably but this is a, a great opportunity. There is massive expectation and opportunity for procurement to preserve value right now. And we'll talk from a risk side, that's one thing, you know, and, and we'll talk a bit more about that, but to also create and sustain value. I think we need to have, again, we talked about a proactive, agile, resilient mindset. We can't be victims of this. We can't sit back and wait for something to happen and then respond when the business says, hey, my supplier's gone or my product's gone, or we don't have masks, um, or we don't have FLIR uh, infra infrared cameras, what are the, what's the next thing we can get ahead of and how do we help in that? We have to be especially resilient in our mindset. It's mass, the upheaval to come, uh, we've seen nothing yet. Um, I think you know rapid acceleration of digital uh, is, is a given, it's already happening, we're all having to work this way. Uh, laggards, when the tide goes out, uh, that's where the laggards are exposed and you're going to see a lot of laggards exposed and they're going to be racing to catch up and they're going to have to because their owners are going to require it. And you're going to see an, an experience, and I, I lived this through various crises in the past, whether it was industry crises uh, or financial crises, um, okay, unprecedented leadership turnover in those periods of time. So your COO that supports you today may not support, not, may not be there tomorrow. You have to be thinking about value and being on the front foot of value as we talked about. This immediate crisis and emergency response, we're trying to shift people's mindsets to, to the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, the reality when we think about, and again, I'm trying to give you things to think about, your businesses are different, every business is different, every circumstance, every customer, every, everything is different. But the difference in this crisis that we're in now, in it being a health crisis and a human crisis versus you know, something that happens periodically in economic crisis is that humans, uh, particularly in developed countries where the money is and where the value is, they have gotten to the top of, of, of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy. So at the top of, at the, top of the hierarchy, we're in self-actualization, being fulfilled, living up to our full potential. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're feeling that we're doing the best job that we can. And all day, every day we wake up and we share our views on social media. We engage with people. We add value in a, in a way that, that we couldn't, um, you know, decades ago or generations ago. And very, very quickly, this, 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 um, this virus is pushing large swaths, generations of people backwards down the, down the hierarchy and it's going to be, it's coming out of this is going to be very, very bumpy. Um, and so I think when we think about, when we think about the realities of, can I eat? Do I have money? Can I pay my bills? Um, you know, can I see people? Can I interact on a social level in, in some way? How do I feel about myself right now besides fearful and exposed? How do I react and behave in that environment? What does it look like to get out of this without a, without a vaccine, without treatments, and then what do the next waves of this look like as this unfolds? We are in for an exceptionally bumpy ride. And I think when you think about that at the same time, it's a brilliant time to be in procurement and it's a brilliant time for procurement leadership in the organization. When you think about carving your space uh, and the value you can add in ways that nobody else is really positioned to, if you have the data 
and you understand the value chain and you understand your the customers externally and internally and how it connects to suppliers in the supply market and you can do that across your geographies and you take some time and actually carve time out to think about the meaning of things. So if you think about, and I, I won't read these all to you, but on the one side, it's more about global kinds of macro things. And then on the other side, it's more about industries and there are many more things to consider. But if you think that that um, the government's attempts to press pause on the world, I'm gonna replace incomes, I'm going to uh, keep a business capability high and that we can just somehow suspend time and then flip it back on and demand comes rushing back. That's just simply not going to be what happens. That's not going to be, that's not going to be how this shapes up. But you have to, what it means for you in your business is going to be very different. Um, and I think as, you know, as, as unprepared as we were, I think as, you know, as a West, as every, nobody's really done this well in the West. Um, and this is kind of the hardest lesson to learn about life cycle total cost of ownership when we were not making investments when they were easy and inexpensive to make and now we're printing trillions of dollars and if we and assuming that everything flips back on in May and if it doesn't flip back on in May then what so I think that uh, you know Bain uh, Bain and company is doing some research and and they said two months of social dis distancing will drive a permanent closure of 1.9 million companies in the US reflecting 4.3 trillion in revenues. Now the government's trying with a policy response, but that's one quarter of US business establishments. And that underpins the entire economy and what happens. It's not gonna all come out at the same time as we're seeing. And this isn't as much as the politics or noise, that is the, the fundamental reason why the choice of we have to start up because how like we can't, like May, that's right around the corner. So how do we deal with those realities? So from a procurement perspective, I think you have to figure, you know, you wanna, you wanna say, okay, what is this gonna mean for our business? How do I use that? And how do I get in front with our business leaders and, and try to add value? Some of the things that we did out of the gate uh, is we said, okay, we have Tealbook. What are we gonna do with this? We have this supplier tool uh, internally where people are, are running in those 12 business units are running back and forth and not talking to each other as well as they could or should or the way they've always done it in terms of, who has, we have a pharmacy, we have grocery stores, we have a refinery, we have a bunch of stuff that's going on across all these different lines of business and they all need the same things at the same time and they're not used to talking to each other about it. How can we help facilitate that? And so we said, okay, one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna track uh, COVID letters and COVID communications from suppliers that we receive and we're gonna put them in a central place where everybody can see them and we're gonna create a disruption flag and we're gonna talk about it that way. And, we and then we talked to the business leaders and we talked to their, lead their, their people down several layers and said, here's the value in using this and, and we want you to come in, it's up to you. And we're seeing a massive response from people into this and, and basically trying to sell them on the reality that over the next at least 12 to 18 months, we gotta go like this and open our, our eyes to the future and these realities. And we have to say, this is gonna go on for a long time. Suppliers are gonna be disrupted. We need to get on, in front of that as much as we can. And it's gonna be, it's gonna come from on the ground. It's gonna come from official press releases. It's come from social media. And it's gonna come from you talking to your contacts and gathering all that data and sharing it in one central place as much as possible and reporting on that. So that's what we've created as an example. That's more of the immediate response. We're now looking ahead and saying, look, as COVID unwinds, it's gonna define 2020. And so we're looking at past recessions, we're modeling, we're doing some strategic thinking, we're creating hypothesis and we're saying, look, we have to manage key risks and deploy new innovations and constrain supply markets. Part of the business, when you look at this business, are going to be constrained supply markets. What are, we, what, what are they? What will they be and how do we get ahead of it? On the other side, there's going to be, there's a lot of a lot of businesses that are, that, that, um, that are seeing lower, labor costs that are seeing and trying to provide innovation. They have a lot of excess capacity and it's a good market to go get value in and to work differently with suppliers to unlock that value together while hopefully keeping them afloat so they can be there to serve your business. And then there are areas where don't bother, but you gotta go through the data and figure out what is what. And that's, that's what we're doing today. And I think that's a, that's a core value procurement can add. And finally, I'll wrap here. I know that um, about uh, a little bit over time, uh, and team members that know me will laugh. It's not it's not an hour and a half over time, so that's good. Um, but look, one of the things that's really important, uh, and I, I'll say this, and I've said, I try to say this to my teams 
And so the partners that I've worked with and that we as a company have worked with that have done amazing work, and we've been very lucky to align with awesome people, but thank you. The digital is nice, data is nice, all of these foundations are nice, but we only succeed through our teams and the environment that we create for them. And as leaders, you take the lessons in that and say, if we don't create this environment, nothing happens from a full potential perspective if we don't invest in our teams, if we don't engage and empower them, follow those leadership principles. And just a big thank you to, to my team and uh, my teams of the past, just amazing people we've had. And I've had the great fortune of working with. Um, I just, you know, I think that's the, that's the, the slide I'd like to end on, Matt. So with that, open it up for any questions. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And I think that this presentation is one that was very much needed by, by everybody in the space. I think uh, at this point, we recognize supplier data problems, but then really understanding how we can act on that has, has been something that is tough to, to, uh, to find. So you do have a number of questions. I've selected a couple already, but everybody else on the phone, you're welcome to submit more. The first one is, Tim, you mentioned talent and the emphasis you need to develop talent. How do you decide which talent to invest in within the organization? That's a, yeah, I mean, that, that's coming from somebody who's living it. That's a great question. Um, thank you. So I think the reality is, um, like with everything, the way that the way that I, I've done it poorly in the past is to take a blanket approach and say, everybody needs this. And here's the tool, here's how the tool works. Uh, or here's the, you know, here's the methodology we want to use. Here's how we think about creating and executing category strategy. Here, and the, and you, you take a, you know, the past was a bit of a blanket approach. And I think now um, there are, you know, there's a new way from a learning and development to try to understand, try to assess the talent pool and focus on what is that current state of the talent and the soft skills, hard skills that you need. And then look at the future and say, okay, look at like even today, what do we, we, what does success look like? What does that success profile look like? What does that job profile relative to success look like in terms of hard skills and soft skills and assess that gap? And I think the way that, you know, effect, you try to do it effectively, which means you have to move. You can't analyze this to death and, and do it one individual at a time, but you can look at larger swaths of personas and say, okay, this group of users impacts the most value. Um, they, um, you know, they, they, they have the biggest gap relative to our where we're going. Um, and we have good methods to deliver uh, learning in some way to help them and to help them apply that um, through a combination, whatever that combination is of, of how they learn, how best they operationalize what they're learning, and then how best they're coached. So I think, you know, it starts with that, that initial assessment. It is re relative to that success profile. And then how do we create a learning journey for them that can be really effective? Um, but if, you know, it, it, does, it does start with that assessment combining them and segmenting into some kind of personas, um, making sure you're focusing on who's gonna impact the value or who needs to impact the value the soonest and aligning the talent strategy with the overall value, the value roadmap. Great, you have you have a couple other questions here and I'll, I'm, I think I'm, I have two set. Um, we'll see if another one comes in that, that uh, is worthy, but this one says, you mentioned needing an agile approach to digital transformation. How do you approach this topic with IT who plans large multi-year projects which inhibit your impact we can have in year one? Yeah, I, I, I firmly, like there's a couple of things that, that I think this is where that initial assessment of who has power in the organization and what work do you do up front to uh, socialize your transformation and what's gonna need to happen. I think I said early on something to the effect that, you know, in that data assessment, you up front at the front of your transformation, you need to understand the, the IT philosophy um, and their approach to digital and the maturity in that approach is an essential question because there are um, increasingly uh, IT leaders are much more about business partnership. It isn't about trying to build a silo and build a kingdom in IT that they give snippets of access to and control spend and control what happens. That is being eroded very rapidly uh, as users and especially right now, users have ex expectations. Uh, users need to be able to move. Users are the, the rest of the business is putting those expectations of value delivery on them. Uh, but you know, if you do that assessment and, and IT is sitting in a silo in a kingdom and unwilling to understand the value potential and is not responsive 
to the CEO, the COO, the CFO who is saying, I see they should be responsive to the CEO, but to the other business leaders who are saying, like this is, you know, this this transformation matters, and you know, you need to partner with procurement in the right way. Procurement has to be open to a partnering in the right way. Um, and I think, I think from the there are just IT function that says we're, you know, we're a we're a sole, you know, we're we're an, we're an Oracle shop or we're an SAP shop, and everything must be SAP. I think those folks um, are are learning. They're, some are learning uh, faster than others that there are different ways to look at this. And um, you know, a vendor like uh, Tealbook, for example, all day, every day, they're trying to figure out how to make it easy, how to make that integration and that link together really easy. Uh, but you know, I think that you have to, you know, selling the value to IT, bringing them along early, uh, getting the mess, having them get the message from the other leaders that this is a top priority and a value driver. If you do that job well, you have a better chance. But sometimes you, it, sometimes it's very, very difficult. And I think that's, as I said, that's one that. Uh, if you have choices in taking jobs and and it looks like it's backward and there's no there's no sort of vision for a better way of doing it, I would avoid that company like the plague. We have one final question for you here, Tim, and this one says, master data is also our biggest challenge, and our data is almost impossible to work with. How did you clean this up for your previous digital transformations? Oh, well, we didn't. I think that the reality is um, until you get um, so from from our lens, let's say from a procurement lens, and and it's great that 80% of the value comes from sourcing and source to contract. Uh, that is a great theory, but the reality is it's the P2P that's creating all day every day or point of sale, uh, however product uh, product and item master is is handled. Uh, the, you have to almost go back to the like you have to go back to the beginning and say what is what while we're cleansing a small piece, and you know there is. Um, exponentially more dirty data being created all day, every day than that. So I think it is number one, be realistic. Number two, which data drives the value the fastest? So we went, you know, early in the transformation, we went after spend data. Uh, we needed spend data. We need categorization. Uh, you know, we needed it in in different lenses. We call it a spend cube. Um, that seems to be going out of vogue, but you know, in, in terms of how um, you know how you how you get visibility in in spend, and then be able to target. Okay, where is there value to get? And then and then start getting that value, reinvesting that value to say, okay, now we need a better approach. You know, we need we need some better P2P because the P2P, if it's broken, if it isn't fully automated end to end, that is a major culprit of creating dirty data all day every day. So how do we fix that? How do we make it easy? And that you almost always starts with the user not using it the right way, not using how it's designed because it's hard. So how do we get in front of that? And and how do we invest in getting in front of that? How do we plan our way through that in in bite-sized pieces that it can be done. There are some things, I mean, it's really, really difficult if you don't go back to that source and have a really good plan on how to invest in it. We got, we dealt with, we just put resources. We use other companies, the buy versus build, like buying AI and machine learning capabilities as we've done with Tealbook, doing that with GEP and, and Bain on SpendCube, um, you know, doing it with, you know, looking from a product uh, and night a master, Working with right now with you know with the data lake the data lake provider Teradata to be able to help with that uh, the BI tool MicroStrategy to help with that you know you just don't have that you have to look at partners to help you with that and while you're making a really good investment plan to deal with in a priority sequence what is creating the dirty data and that gets back it's a complex thing because it's about human behavior how the systems are used how the systems are set up how data you know how do you have a plan for standardizing the master data in a way that that can connect to the supply market, that connect to the customer, connect to the retail store end to end? Um, you got a bunch of legwork to do to make that those foundations possible for then, if you have the right user experience for that to work in a system that then creates clean data increasingly. So the, you got to switch this creating dirty data to creating clean data, give it enough time, it scrubs out the dirty data, and then you get there at the end. But the first answer was we never got there, never got there. We're, we get there in some some ways, other ways we're still working on it, and it is a really tough problem. Thank you very much for your time today, Tim. I, I think that this uh, presentation is going to be extremely valuable. It may look back at the end and may think it was the most impactful of the whole series. So thank you very much for your time.
And for everybody else on the phone, we, I got a fair amount of questions all asking for the deck in this presentation. I think there's a lot of material, material in there. Um, on Monday next week, this presentation will be posted to our YouTube so you can watch it directly again. And then we have decided just because of the sheer volume of questions that we will post this presentation in PDF form under the resources tab on the on the Teal Book website. So it will be a couple of days before it is there, but you can go and receive that presentation in that section. Thank you everybody for joining us this week. Please join in next Wednesday as we continue our journey, this time looking about the data foundation and how it has a name. Thanks everyone.